Chancellor, it is my pleasure to welcome now uh, to moderate this amazing panel, the head of communications of the UN Committee on Road Food Security. Hello, Aganju. Good morning. Hello, Caroline. I'm, it's good morning and good afternoon from Nairobi. Really good to see you again. Yes. I hope you can hear me all right. It's very good to be with you again. Thank you very much, you and all the speakers, for joining us today. Weganju, so you are free to go. Please introduce the panelists, and the floor is yours. Many, many thanks, uh, Caroline, and congratulations to you and all the colleagues who have uh, spent sleepless nights putting this together. It's such a timely um, event, which is coming together very, very well, and on topics that are critical I believe not only to Africa and Brazil, but to the rest of the world as well. Um, mm -hmm. as, as, as Caroline has said, colleagues, friends, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Waigan Jinjiroge, and I'm sending you very, very warm greetings from Nairobi in Kenya. Um, I head communications of the Rome-based Committee on World Food Security, popularly called ourselves CFS. And I'm really pleased to be anchoring this conversation today. Um, but as Caroline has said, it's close to most of our hearts on sustainable agriculture and food production. How do we ensure climate smart food systems? And these are critical issues, um, not only to us, but even at the on world food security. Um, and this is a committee that deals with um, you know, bringing all sorts of stakeholders together uh, to discuss critical issues um, impacting hunger and malnutrition um, globally. And hence why, as a man who um, drives our communications work, I'm excited to be um, uh, joining this conversation and moderating it. Um, and the topic is also personal. Like what Caroline said, it's close to her heart, it's also personal to me. Um, my country, like most other countries in Africa, and across the developing world, um, are suffering disproportionately the impacts of climate change which has eroded most of the food security and nutrition gains uh, that we have made over the years. As such, um, the imperative to act has never been great, and the urgency as well. And I believe all of us joining today have a moral duty to address the twin challenge of environmental degradation, uh, which comes with its cousin, the bully climate change, and eliminating hunger and malnutrition. And our panel today, and I'm really pleased to have such a rich, diverse group of panelists, uh, will be addressing um, you know, how we find solutions to address these uh, uh, challenges. And our panelists are, and this is no particular order, uh, we have Dr. Maria Helena Semedo, who is the Deputy Director General at FAO. Warm welcome to you, Dr. Semedo. We have Dr. Yemi Akimbamijo, uh, who is the Executive Director of Forum for Agricultural Research in Africa. Farah, Dr. Kim Bamijo, it's good to see you again and welcome to uh, the uh, panel. We also have Mr. Faisal Benamua, who is a senior vice president for East Africa at OCP Group. Warm welcome to you, Mr. Benamua. And finally, um, we have Mr. Klaus Renault, who is IFAD country director in Brazil. IFAD is the International Fund for Agricultural Development, also based out of Rome. Warm welcome to you, Mr. Renault. And I'll kick off this conversation in a short while to hear from our panelists, um, especially around um, the question of how can we structure climate smart food systems to cope with today's challenges without exhausting natural resources or harming future generations. We can't be selfish that we live the world in a way that our children and their children will not have an inhabitable planet. And I'll start with you, Dr. Semedo. The recent edition of the State of Food Security and Nutrition in the World Report, SOFI 2021, which you produced with a number of other UN agencies, um, has given us a really sobering outlook of the global food security and nutrition challenge. You say close to 811 million people were hungry in 2020, about 3 billion people lack access to healthy diet. How do we address these without having the environment? Is it even possible, Dr. Semedo? Over to you. Thank you, Juan Ganjo. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, good afternoon. Bon dia, boa tarde. Bon dia, Carolina. Good afternoon to all. First of all, let me thank the Brazil African Forum for inviting FAO to join this panel. Let me greet my fellow panelists. Uh, 
Uh, let me start for something you and Caroline said. Uh, to achieve, we cannot achieve sustainable development without address food security. We cannot uh, thrive as a society with people being in extreme poverty, hunger, malnutrition. But we cannot achieve food production and with uh, not taking care of, of our environment. This to say that environment should go hand in hand with development and food security or food system needs to go hand in hand with a sustainable environment. And this to say that, as you re uh, rightly said, today we have 811 million people facing hunger and one third in Africa. What are the drivers of that? We refer to climate variability and extremes, conflict, economic slowdowns and downturns. And now if you see it has been exacerbated by COVID-19 pandemic. And COVID-19 increased for more than 100 million, 130 million people suffering for, for food insecurity. And if we continue with this path, we cannot achieve our sustainable development agenda. And we continue with a, in a world where we have food security, malnutrition, poverty, and we don't reach the goals our leaders, they commit in, 20, in 2015. Then what we need to do? First, we need to have a holistic system-based approach. Uh, and I think the Food System Summit show us that we cannot look only at production. We need to look to production, to transformation, to consumption. And this is where we have to have a systemic approach where we can produce, but we can bring the maximum benefits to our natural resources or the minimum impact on nat our natural resources. What we need? We need a more efficient, inclusive, and resilient agri-food systems. How to do it? To produce sustainably, where we have a lot of agroecology is one solution, how we can use less input, but produce the same with less, how we can bring more efficient to, to water, to, to land, but also we need to put biodiversity at the center of agro, agro food system. We need to sustainably use what we have in terms of ecosystem, species, and genetic resources. And uh, biodiversity will also provide us the diversification of our food. We are not putting pressure on five uh, varieties we are doing. And we have examples. I don't know if you can enter now in examples, but just to tell you that it's possible to produce more food, to increase, to reduce the food insecure number of people, at the same time, we protect our, our environment. Uh, I will talk later about what we have in FAO, what we have done with uh, IFAR, with uh, uh, FARA, with other partners, but I think you have uh, a panoply of solutions uh, with climate smart approach, which can give us the solution to what we are talking today. And I think the nature-based solution, the circular economy principles, where we reduce the waste, we can use the organic waste, we can improve the, the access to renewable energy. They are all uh, examples and evidence that it's possible and we can do it. We need uh, policies, we need investment, but more than that, we need leadership. Let me stop with this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Semedo. And I like that you have started itemizing some practical examples of things that we need to do to address this false dichotomy between development, environmental sustainability, and development you're looking at feeding um, uh, our people by doing it um, sustainably. I will I'll come to you, Dr. King Bamejo, and I want us to bring it slightly closer home um, to Africa. And this year we have seen two landmark global moments. We have had the UN Food Systems um, Summit, and we just a couple of weeks back, we had the Climate Change Conference of Parties 26 that happened in Glasgow. 
and there's more, many more to come, including the nutrition for growth summit. How do we tap the momentum of these um, events um, to climate proof African food systems to, you know, as you say, we are affected badly by climate change. How do we, are we seeing anything practical that we can utilize out of these moments? Oh, thank you very much, uh, Waiganjo. I think that's a wonderful question from your end. Um, let me first of all send greetings to the panelists and the listeners. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you may be listening or watching this event from. And also to give my warm compliments to my dear friend and brother, Jean Bosco Monte. Now, you have um, raised a very good um, point, Waiganjo, given all of these events that are happening, especially in the course of this year, 2020, we shouldn't be facing these, what are called the paradox of poverty and hunger, and a lot of the, the, the fallout from this, given that this is a year in which we've had we just closing from the COP, we just had the UN Food System Summit, all of them bringing to the fore how to address the key concern of SDG number two in particular. But then the key question which you have raised, my dear brother, is how can we climate proof the production system? Now, doing this, climate proofing the food system is a multifaceted challenge and the solution must also be multifaceted. It must be multidimensional. I mean, Madam Semedo referred to, alluded to some of the issues a short while ago. It must be addressed from a biological point of view. I seem to have lost Dr. Kimba Major for a moment there. He was having tr trouble with connection. He's at the moment in Johannesburg in South Africa. So as, as we wait for Dr. Kimba Major to connect, I'll come to you. Are you back, Dr. Kimba Major? You unfortunately um, I think I'll hear. just switch off my... Yeah, that's probably better. That's a shame. I'm sorry about this. Um, do you hear me now? We hear you loud and clear. Thank you. Carry on. Thank you. Apologies for that. I, I cannot control this, but this is how it is. So basically, what I'm trying to say is that in order to climate prove the production system, which is a necessity for us in Africa, we need to look at three aspects. The three aspects are one, we need to look at the biology of the production system. Secondly, we need to look at the social infrastructure, the social, um, the, the social aspect of the, of, of the production system, which includes infrastructure marketing, and most importantly, what technologies. Now, when I mean technology, I'm not talking about biotechnologies, but I'm looking at technologies that can allow us to extend shelf life, to reduce post-harvest losses. So in other words, what is clear to us is that we need to produce more with less. We are confronted with a scenario where the natural resources that produce our food is not unlimited. And it seems in a way that we are exceeding the carrying capacity of the planet. So it means that if we are not careful, we will be burning the candle at both ends, or we will be digging a hole to fill a hole. Therefore, to avoid this double whammy, intensification will become crucial. And Waiganjo, let it be clear, only 10% of our production, of our food production system, will emanate from expansion of land areas. The remaining 90% will come from intensification. And so the better we prepare for this, the better we can climate proof 
or rather, the better we climate proof our systems, the better we can prepare ourselves for sustainable intensification. But let me stop there for now. And I'm sorry for the unstable internet issues that are, we're having. Not a problem at all, Dr. King Bermuda. We totally understand what happens to all of us. Um, and, and you have started uh, speaking to a few very interesting items that we come to, including how to start incentivizing good behavior in a sense. Um, and, and I can't wait to hear from you and the rest of the panelists about that. But before we get to that, um, Mr. Reno, um, you, you sit in a very interesting place at IFA, uh, IFA Dragon, um, in Brazil. You must have seen quite a few examples of um, um, addressing these issues without, as Dr. King Bermijo has said, lighting the candle on both ends. Are there examples of um, initiatives you're seeing in Brazil that Africa could learn from and vice versa that are in Africa that Brazil could learn from? Thanks so much, Vaiganjo, and uh, also my hearty thank you to the Brazil Africa Institute for organizing this panel and the forum, and, and a greeting also to my fellow panelists. Um, I, I think these questions are really important, and I, I like the way in which uh, both Maria Elena and Yemi have been addressing this uh, so far. I think, um, obviously, we have a huge twin challenge here. We have a food security challenge and we have a climate challenge. And I think we even have a third one, which is a biodiversity challenge. And those three need to be somehow looked at together. And, and yes, we do have examples. We have, we have examples of how not to do it in Brazil. And we have examples of how it can be done much better, much smarter. And um, in in respect of how not to do it, I think the dual agricultural system that we have in Brazil uh, with a very intensive industrial agriculture on the one hand and a very low intensity, low output smallholder agriculture on the other hand with millions of small farms uh, just in Brazil, um, that gives us basically the whole spectrum of it. Um, if I look at the, the industrial agriculture, just to, to say a little bit on, on how not to do it in a, in a climate smart way, um, I think the intensification that Yemi was mentioning, which is badly needed in order to feed the world, that uh, should not go the way of very large fields uh, with single species, which create a kind of green desert um, using lots of herbicides and pesticides to poison the environment. And also the deforestation that often goes with it is definitely um, of grave concern. So there we have the, the climate uh, aspects also right in it. I think if we look at uh, local solutions to to these global problems then then we need to to look at ways in which people can actually live with nature and produce produce both an income and produce food um, and thereby also look at the uh, at the distribution effects of it because it doesn't it doesn't really help our uh, our food security if we have production of enough food but then a very part, a very large part of the of the world population cannot afford to get that food. So we need to have the distribution also in there, and that's where the smallholder farmers come in. And they have lots of solutions where they are actually working with a great biodiversity on their farms. Uh, in Brazil, IFAD is promoting agroforestry systems, for example, in the very hostile semi-arid region where people are struggling with a long dry spill. And by having a very uh, good mix of crops, including uh, annual crops and also tree crops, and the tree crops very often um, providing also fodder for small stock, um, including also Opuntia cactus, uh, which is really hardy and which can survive the long dry spill. Um, we have a lot of solutions there which are creating soil cover to prevent erosion, which are keeping the soil cool, which are increasing the uh, the organic content in the soil and thereby really create a sustainable system that is also climate smart because it does accumulate climate uh, carbon in the soil. Um, so we have mitigation effects right there. Um, and we also have lots of adaptation effects because the hardy species can adapt to different, uh, different environments. We have the diversity, we have the crop cover and we have the soil health 
which comes with it and all the um, the different organisms that uh, that live there and the different mechanisms that can basically uh, control uh, the system getting out of uh, <clears throat> out of control this or that way uh, with pests uh, which may multiply you then have other pests that can control them so a diverse uh, system like this is much more healthy and and can provide the income and also the food um, for the people. So we need to uh, have these kind of solutions in order to get away from a situation where smallholder farmers um, cannot produce enough food, don't have enough land um, in order to feed themselves. And it is it is one of the big absurdities that uh, the people who produce food, the farmers, uh, in uh, many countries are actually the ones going hungry. Thank you. Thank you, Reno, for sharing that. And I think that, that, that point you closed, I think, is, it, it is critical. That the people who produce uh, food are, you know, often cases they're, they're the most hungry. And, and, and this is a tragedy, or if not an indictment on, on all of us. Um, Mr. Benamur, yours is, a, is an interesting place where you, you, you see it in terms of you represent a constituency that is significantly different from the other panelists. Um, from OCP, where you're constantly innovating and finding new ways of, 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 of increasing uh, productivity, what are some of the approaches that you're pushing that can help us feed um, um, the increasing population while uh, sustaining the integrity of, of our environment? Thank you, my brother, when, uh, when Ganjo. Uh, I think we are all here, uh, uh, let's say, uh, worried about the same dilemma, uh, how to produce more uh, to face uh, the food insecurity and uh, the hunger that is increasing, especially in uh, during this COVID time, and especially in Africa. and. Uh, but in the same time, how to do it in a sustainable manner uh, without uh, uh, aggravating the situation of climate change and, uh, uh, and the increase of uh, the global heat of, uh, temperature. Uh, I, I think Af Africa may not be the main trigger or the, the biggest contributor to climate change, but uh, Looking at the numbers and the exposition of some African countries to natural disaster, uh, it's the first to be impacted by climate change. And agricultural productivity will come under pressure from climate change, with large part of Africa expected to experience uh, down, uh, down, uh, down road yield pressure of above, uh, above 15 percent. Okay. And it's estimated that across Africa, maize yield will drop by 5 percent and the wheat yield would drop by 17% by 2050 if we remain with the same situation. So let's ask uh, ourselves the, the key question, how can African countries, along with international partners, join a hand to contribute together to mitigate this issue? And for us, uh, there is two, two key words as the answer to this uh, dilemma. It's carbon sequestration. Uh, you know that this specific topic today is more important than ever. Uh, and strategic for African continent, uh, as the potential for Africa is to capture uh, the last uh, academic research, uh, provide an estimation of 530 million tons of CO2 captured per year, uh, almost three times the, uh, the global potential of European uh, uh, continent. And if we look at the Brazilian experience in this field uh, with what have been done in uh, uh, in Serato region uh, along since the start of CO2 sequestration project. What started as an environmental project is becoming now a structural and well-organized ecosystem, controlled and managed by sole institution uh, and Brazilian research, uh, research institute. Uh, and, and for us, this carbon sequestration uh, um, methodology have two, let's say, two big arms. The first one uh, is the smart and balanced fertilization to restore soil health and its biomass and its ability uh, to secure better yield and therefore uh, the needed food uh, to feed our population. 
Uh, and the second one is appropriate farming practices, like the non-tillage called also conservation agriculture, the ground cover, the crop, crop rotation and biodiversity. Uh, we, in, uh, we at OCP, we are focused on the, on the first part of, uh, of this uh, approach of carbon sequestration, addressing the smart and balanced fertilization. We have invested heavily in different African countries to, let's, to, uh, to put in place this balanced and smart fertilization. First, by developing with the African uh, partners soil fertility map in order to make sure uh, that we are assessing uh, the nutrient availability in African soils. And then, uh, secondly, uh, to translate the, this soil, uh, those, uh, soil fertility map we are, we are developing uh, in those African countries to customize the fertilizers. So investing in R&D to develop those uh, customized fertilizers and then uh, investing heavily in, uh, in uh, production assets to make uh, those uh, customized uh, formula uh, available for the, for the different uh, smallholder farmer across the continent. Thank you, Mr. Benemuan. And I like the direction you have taken as you have not only um, itemized a few things that need to be done to get us to a place where we achieve sustainable agriculture, but uh, started speaking about some ways of incentivizing that, making it happen, including production of uh, soil maps, etc. And I still stay with you. What what other approaches? How do you get governments, farmers, um, the partners you mentioned to um, start taking up uh, sustainable agriculture? Um, and is it even possible? Is it possible to get sustainable agriculture from where you sit? And if yes, how do we achieve it? Uh. I, I, I will give it as an example what the success story we had in, in Ethiopia. Uh, we started a few years uh, back by, the, as I said, developing the soil fertility map. We did it with the ATA at the time, the uh, Ethiopian Agricultural Transformation Agency and the Ethiopian Ministry of Agriculture. Uh, it took for us uh, three years to develop uh, uh, a whole, uh, a comprehensive soil fertility map of the country. Uh, we turn it to uh, uh, customize the formula for each region uh, in, in Ethiopia, for Amhara, for Oromia, Southern Province, uh, uh, Tigray, all, all the region. And uh, by developing those uh, customized uh, formula, it turned to be less, uh, less expensive to procure for smallholder farmer. Uh, and it's it, it secure for them plus 40% on their agricultural yield. So imagine a smallholder farmer with the same annual effort he is spending in his plot plant, uh, getting plus 40% in the year and spending less on uh, supplying fertilizer. And uh, the result at, at national level, and we are not talking about uh, uh, field demonstration or uh, sample, we are talking as at, about result at a very large uh, country. Uh, it provides to Ethiopia plus 20% uh, for its uh, global food production. And in uh, th the last two years, Ethiopia that have been suffering from severe famine uh, 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 crisis uh, for decades, the last two years, Ethiopia is exporting uh, food crops, is exporting maize to, to Kenya. And all these schemes have been developed without subsidy. It has been developed thanks to the, the governance and the, the commitment of the Ethiopian uh, uh, government, and uh, in the same times to the R&D effort and the, in the, uh, the trust in, uh, in this vision uh, developed by OCP Group and uh, its different subsidiary. Thank you very much, and um, it's good to hear about that really practical example. Um, and I, I turn to uh, Dr. Semedo at the very beginning, I started giving us a couple of examples, and um, FAO probably is the most influential of institutions on global um, agriculture. Um, what are some of uh, some approaches that you have seen work uh, with all stakeholders from farmers to governments? Um, in this effort to drive um, sustainability in, in the agricultural sector, Dr. Samiru. Okay, thank you. Let me just comment for some of what the, my fellow panelists said. 
uh, the first is we need to put farmers at the center and we need to, to give them the appropriate incentive and also the financial support. Um, we need to bring innovations. And I would like uh, to agree with Yemi that innovation is not only technology. Innovation are the knowledge. It can come from the farmers, it can come from the indigenous people, are solutions which has shown that they can be multiplied. Uh, and we need to have what we call a package of innovative solution to be, chair, to be shared across regions and across continents, uh, if, if I can uh, use the, this word. Uh, and the solution is there. I think we mentioned some coming from Brazil. We have the experience from Cerrado. I also would like to share with you an experience from Brazil, what they call the low carbon agriculture plan the Brazil has this plan and they provide uh, low interest to the farmers who wants to implement the sustainable agriculture practices. And really it shows that it can change uh, the use of agriculture um, approaches if we have the appropriate incentives. But the incentives goes to seeds, it goes to uh, the, the new technologies, it goes to the climate services. We didn't talk much about what climate uh, service we can provide in weather, weather forecast, in early warning system. They are very also important, but we refer on diversification of cropping system, the conservation agriculture, deficiency on water management. We have a platform where we call VAPOR. It gives you the water you need in different regions and with different crops. And I can tell you that uh, we show yesterday a map in a region where we can see uh, dark in terms of desert and where we use the appropriate water, you can see some greening coming. This is what I call, we need some technology to give us to improve productivity and to improve efficiency. And what we also call the circular economy, where we reduce the waste and we can always use the waste on organic compost, on energy, and also reduce the food waste. We didn't talk much, but when we waste food, we are wasting the inputs. We are contributing to uh, the increase the carbon uh, in, uh, in the atmosphere. And this is really an important issue. But another example that it has been very much discussed, we discussed in the COP26, we had what we call a methane pledge. And if you see that 40% of the methane is coming from livestock and it's coming from rice production, Brazil have the solutions, how we can use to reduce the methane and to continue to have our livestock production. It could be through different feed, it could be to different breeding, it could, to have more integrated production like agroforestry. But just to tell you an example, several examples, and you ask how to bring the governments. And I think we need to bring the governments with the appropriate policies and appropriate incentives. And another uh, issue raised is the partnership and how to bring the private sector on the solution and to the debate. This is really important. It's not a problem of the government, it's a problem of the full spectrum of stakeholders in the food system or agri food system uh, approach. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Semedo. Um, Dr. Kim Bumidu, are you seeing uh, from where you sit um, with, with another view of um, operations on the continent uh, in Africa? Uh, what are some of Great examples you're seeing uh, following up on what both Dr. Semedo and Mr. Benimua have said, um, that, that we have the right type of incentives, uh, governments are taking these up, all the stakeholders that Dr. Semedo has said, it's not an issue for governments, only it's for all of us. What, what are some of the examples you're seeing? Okay, um, first of all, I think I will switch off my camera so that I can be able to speak with uh, less uh, interference. Well, notice why Ganjo, I started off my intervention by saying that we have a paradox of poverty and hunger. 
And I think that where we are today, um, looking, are you hearing me? Yeah, can yes, you hear here. you all right? Oh, okay. All right, sorry. So where we are today, um, it is very well known that Africa is very well resourced, but it must take the right type of policies, the right type of um, technologies to unlock the potentials that we have always been talking about. Now, just to be brief, we know that Africa can actually um, overcome the food challenge and become a, a kind of a world food, food basket, but the resources are largely untapped because leave alone the COVID, the climate, uh, the, the climate change impact on the continent is already overwhelming. So it will necessarily take a lot of science and biotechnology to unlock the latent values of these potentials. Now, biotechnology is not everything, but we need to have the right policies. We need to have the, the political will, the right type of leadership. And we understand that these biologic, uh, biological attributes that will better characterize, need to be better characterized, conserved, and utilized. And, and be conserved for future generation. I was very happy to hear from uh, my brother from the OCP, uh, Mr. Benamoa, uh, that with the work that we're doing, also guiding and mapping and helping us to use resources in a, in a very optimal way. I think we need to bring all science together, bring all the policies together, and to put in all of these into use, we will be able to meet our goals. Over to you, Wagan. Thank you very much. We have you very, very well, Dr. Kim Bamuja. I think this, the solution you have improvised is, um, is working. Um, Mr. Rayner, from, from, you mentioned a couple of examples of work that IFAD is driving in, in, in Brazil. Are you seeing an uptake of this? You talked about agroforestry and a couple of other examples. And how are you doing to drive that um, up? Uh, sorry, Baganjo, could you just repeat that? Am I seeing? Um, what, what are you doing to drive the uptake of some of those great examples you gave us of some work you are um, driving in Brazil? Right, many thanks. Important question because, uh, as, I was mentioned, as I was mentioning, the millions of smallholder farmers we have here, uptake is really a big issue. And, uh, and it's a big challenge for us to reach as many farmers as really need uh, these kind of technologies. So we have we have a whole repertoire of uh, semi-arid technologies, um, which which have been tested in our projects um, as <clears throat> um, being sustainable and responsive and creating income. Um, but to roll them out to uh, to the two million smallholder farmers which uh, mm -hmm. are working in the semi-arid of Brazil um, and uh, let alone uh, the millions of farmers in Africa that could also very well use them, that is a real challenge. And uh, we've obviously uh, seen difficulties during the pandemic. Uh, the extension services cannot go out and reach farmers, but that's also uh, led us to um, a number of solutions. So in a way, turning this to an opportunity has been possible. Um, working uh, in, a, in a remote way, um, trying to complement the traditional extension services with digital and remote extension, um, people uh, being called on their cell phones um, to be able to ask questions, to be able to reach uh, them with suggestions. Um, and, and we see that uh, there is a lot still to do in terms of digital technical assistance um, with which 
um, farmers can be reached in order to learn about uh, new options and, and also the challenges that they are facing. And, and I think uh, the carbon sequestration uh, issue is one which very many farmers haven't seen yet. So I'm very grateful to, uh, to Faisal Ben Amur for mentioning that. And at the same time, I think that the sustainable issues really require a lot of collaboration with research institutions, uh, like we are working with Embrapa, for example, on developing technologies for, um, for carbon-free or low carbon livestock production for smallholders and for uh, small stock, um, like Embrapa has already developed it for large scale producers. And, and so these things are really important. And at the same time, many sustainable uh, or sustainability questions need to be understood better and need to be taken into account. Like, for example, the phosphate fertilizer that, that Ben Amur was mentioning. Um, I think that um, the, <clears throat> the phosphate crisis, um, which is looming above us uh, with the possibility of uh, the phosphate that we're using being exhausted by 2040, um, that is a real challenge. So um, is it sustainable to apply larger amounts of fertilizer? Probably not. Um, and uh, we also have phosphate pollution issues. I think these things need to be taken into account in order to really reach sustainable production systems which create income and which also produce the um, sufficient amounts and qualities of food that we need for the world population. Excellent. Really good examples there, Reno, and um, great work that you and colleagues um, and taking mm -hmm. wishing the very, very best. Um, we, are, we are approaching the end of our, of our panel discussion. We just have about five or so minutes to go. Um, and I know we have all touched on different examples of um, solutions, practices that should be transferred between um, countries and, and regions, especially in the developing uh, well, I'll give you an impossible task of uh, distilling those into one or two. If, if, if your life depended on it, what are those two or so practices or solutions that you'd say, let's take them from one region uh, to, the, uh, to the other. And I'll start with you, Dr. Kimba Mijan, because this will be a party shot. We want this to be what people uh, remember as part of this cross-pollination uh, exercise. Okay, thank you very much, Raganjo. Once again, I'll switch off my camera. And I just want to say that um, what lessons have we learned from the um, inter-regional cooperations um, that can become one of the take-home messages from this event? Um, we at FARA, we are currently running a program with the government of Brazil which is a hand-holding um, program that we call pedagogical retooling. In other words, we are trying to remodel the way we train and build capacities for agriculture. And right now we have 120 students who just left for Brazil some three weeks ago. Now the reason is very simple, Waganjo. On the African continent, we are graduating about 40,000 ag agriculture graduates every year, but the food bill is on the increase. Now, this doesn't add up. And we are asking ourselves, how did Brazil manage to transition from a food net importer to net exporter? over a period that is what we are now trying to unravel and to do a kind of a technology trans We're losing you, Dr. Kimba Mejo. I'm afraid it looks like the network doesn't, is struggling to hold. Can you try it again? Just try come through, we see. Now, it looks like we have lost Dr. So I'll come to you, Dr. Sinedo. You, you didn't hear me. No, we lost you for a moment. Yes, I think we are Go having ahead, some troubles listening to Dr. Akimba Michio again. Maybe you can move to other speaker right now. 
Totally agree with you, Caroline. So Dr. Semedo, I know saying it's an impossible task for you to <laughs> summarize it to one or two things. Okay. Let me maybe give you an example, something we didn't refer, is um, land restoration. You know that in Africa, we have 393 million of dry land, degraded dry land. And FAO is not only FAO, FAO is working with a multitude of the UN and other partners to convert those lands in countries such as Burkina Faso, Nigeria, Niger, Senegal, to restore them and come in an area where we can produce nutritious food, we can produce feed, energy, and shelter. And this will bring increased production, increased income, increased food, and livelihoods and bring resilience to climate change. This is something we started in Africa. We are going to Latin America and we are going to Asia to reproduce what we are doing. This is an example which can scale up and go beyond uh, a region. Thank you very much, Dr. Semedo. Uh, Mr. Benemua, anything from your end? I will conclude by, uh, if I have to, to pick one topic, uh, it would be the, the four R nutrients to achieve a framework, which means uh, uh, the right uh, balance of nutrients, the right uh, rate, the right time at the right place. And uh, to do so, we have to invest in R&D. We have to invest in uh, providing the appropriate training to the farmer and to invest in the industrial asset that turn the outcome of uh, the errand to the right input uh, provided to the trained farmer. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Reina, over to you. Thanks so much. And after these really valuable contributions by my colleagues, I'd like to concentrate on water because I see that as a huge challenge, um, especially in the context of climate change. And, and one solution that I really like are underground dams, which IFA support projects are financing in Brazil. Uh, these underground dams um, are simple plastic sheets which are dug vertically into the soil in a gently sloping valley and that prevents a lot of water runoff and accumulates rainwater in the ground and that rainwater would otherwise erode the slope and now it keeps the soil moist and actually it needs no extra space as dams do. So these underground dams, they can hold hundreds of cubic meters of water, they can feed shallow wells from which fields can be irrigated, they allow the land to be cultivated with diverse crops including fruit trees, and it's a system that can help with adaptation to rising temperatures and also dwindling rainfall. Um, so it really promotes biodiversity, carbon accumulation, soil fertility, and a lot of diversified food production. So I think it's a, it's a very good solution for smallholder farmers, which we would also very much like to promote in many places in Africa. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Reino. I'll come to Dr. Kimbamijo to see whether he's able to complete his thought. Dr. Kimbamijo, over to you. I can only say that we need to see how we can exchange capacities, uh, strengthen capacities to be able to mitigate these challenges. Um, one current example that I mentioned earlier on is the contribution of the government of Brazil zeal to the training of um, I'm afraid we have lost you again Dr. King Bamejo to um, graduate itself um, from being are you hearing me? Yeah, we hear you now Okay, my goodness I'm very sorry about this In any case, the last word is that we just need to see, I mean, an example of, of a best practice is what we are doing with the, the government of Brazil now for agriculture and the value chain development. I think I'll leave it as that. I'm sorry about these connection issues. Not a problem whatsoever. Everyone, that has been an incredibly enlightening conversation. Um, and many, many thanks to our panelists for sharing with us their own experiences, the experiences of their own institutions. We cannot thank you enough. My takeaway from this is 
The challenge may appear complex. The solutions don't sound complex. I think it's possible, it's doable. We need to get down to work. I thank you all for your time and looking forward to continuing this conversation. And I hand it back to Caroline and thank you, Caroline and your team for uh, putting this together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eganju, and all the speakers. I cannot say how pleased I am for being here today learning with you. It was an amazing panel. And for sure, after the, the event, I'm going to have to rewatch this to catch a little bit of your thoughts today. Thank you very much for joining us today.